Hello everyone, I'm here to discuss with you uh, Arnold and Huxley. Um, since we didn't get to meet in class today, I thought to provide uh, somewhat of an overview of some of the main ideas to take away from this debate. In the 19th century, you know, with the uh, the sciences are certainly on the rise, it have been since the Enlightenment era, as far as ways of understanding, um, you know, nature and the universe come through, you know, scientific observation, which is what Huxley certainly argues for um, in his piece, uh, that, you know, the necessity for literature is not as great as it is for natural sciences, those who rely on, you know, interacting with the world and measuring and actually observing it, as opposed to, you know, finding wisdom and, uh, and truth through words. In fact, he says, you know, look look at things and not words uh, to, find, you know, to find your truth. And so it is a rising time, as we talked about with the industrial progress um, and the, you know, numerous changes taking place during the Victorian era. Um, science is becoming a real contender, still somewhat of an art underdog in the world of academia, uh, but it's becoming a contender as far as be coming included. And this is certainly the argument that Huxley makes. In fact, um, his argument is very clever in how kind of somewhat underhanded it is as far as, you know, uh, almost building um, somewhat of what we would call in rhetoric uh, a straw man that he can knock down pretty easily. In fact, towards the end of uh, the excerpt from Science and Culture, it even says that uh, he says, thus I venture to think that the pretensions of our modern humanists to the possession of the monopoly of culture and to the exclusive inheritance of the spirit of antiquity must be abated, if not abandoned. Meaning he's it sounds like he's actually all right with kind of abandoning uh, the humanities in favor for science at this point. Um, you know, and he says some pretty, uh, you know, uh, um, kind of offensive things towards the humanities. Although one thing to keep in mind is that him and Huxley were actually very, you know, we're, we're good friends to a certain, certain degree. Um, in fact, both were very interested in education. As we read with Arnold's bio, he worked in education for you know for most of his life, and was very interest you know very interested in it. So yeah, up till this point, he's right about you know universities you know got their start um, usually around the Middle Ages with uh, but they were almost wholly ecclesiastical. In fact, education for a while was restricted to you know our first scholars were usually monks, um, and then you know it. it more learning as things progressed more learning became restricted to nobility and the clergy and that was it and so a lot a lot of the things that he you know a lot of the attacks that he you know launches against the against this this tradition of you know the classics of you know greek and latin origin um and knowing latin and greek which is interesting because if you are in the science field i'm sure you can encounter a lot of latin terms so some of the attacks are a little little interesting in that matter um since they rely so heavily on Latin and Greek. But he talks about, you know, relying on Homer and Virgil and, you know, some of those things as not being necessarily relevant anymore uh, to this new new age. Um, in fact, there's a lot of things that he talks about in in his essay. Talk, in fact, he talks about what he has to contend with, such as, you know, the practical men of business and then the Levites in charge of the archiculture. And he, what he means there is people of the humanities, people who you know, who teach Latin and Greek uh, classics and then teach, in fact, in defense of the classic, you see uh, Arnold actually using Greek to, you know, defend his position um, about, you know, you know, conserving that order. In fact, uh, this, in fact, part of Huxley's argument is that it is a conservative order that is not conforming to the more modern state of things. Um, he tries to argue that uh, scientific education is as effectual by itself as, you know, even contributing to culture. Um, in fact, he brings up the distinction between someone who's educated versus a specialist, whereas a scientist, a natural scientist, is considered a specialist versus, you know, someone of a man of letters like Arnold who is educated, and he thinks that distinction's unfair, um, which is one of the reasons why he's praising this new school. That's, in fact, that's the occasion, is that a new, you know, a new college is being, you know, funded by a businessman who is, you know, pretty much making exclusively a natural sciences education. And it's interesting to think about this, because these are arguments that are still relevant to today. In fact, we have a new, um, well, especially since it seems like science has, you know, gained a lot of ground in this debate as far as getting more priority in, in certain 
um, in certain arenas. Like if you look across the street from the liberal arts building, you'll see a new health and sciences building being erected. Um, <clears throat> and the tensions still kind of carry on as far as trying to pit science and humanities against each other, which is sometimes unfair because that has not, you know, it hasn't always been that way. Um, and in fact, it's around this time, um, uh, there's one uh, critic who refers to this dilemma as the two cultures between science and humanities as being two separate entities. But there are some in the field who, you know, would like to, you know, not necessarily think of them as so separate, uh, or at least have more of an inter interdisciplinary communication. So yeah, it's still, it, it's still kind of a, you get a sense of hostility from Huxley, especially how he attacks uh, the basis of kind of a superstitious, superstitious kind of basis for uh, university education, such as, you know, scientists being referred to as sorcerers and um, during that time, because man thought they were the center of the universe um, and thought the earth was the center of the universe. And he's, and he talks about, and this is on page 1455, how that is not the case anymore. How science is showing, you know, um, anyone who appeared to venture into science thought they were, you know, who studied nature was, thought that nature was the playground for the devil kind of things. And he's, he starts to say that uh, they learned that the earth is the center of the visible universe, talking about people of the Middle Ages. Um, and more especially was it, uh, and, the, oh, and that man is the sinosure of things terrestrial, and more especially was it, inculcated that the course of nature had no fixed order but that could be and constantly was altered by the agency of innumerable spiritual beings good and bad according as they were moved by deeds and prayers of men so he's kind of mocking that superstitiousness as you know being outdated and not something that is suited to a culture that is progressing so much especially based on technological innovations informed by you know technological sciences and he's saying the same thing about natural science about studying you know nature and the, and the way the world works um, he makes he makes references to, you know, reforms such as uh, uh, that the humanists actually had to bring about more education, like in the Renaissance, which is when uh, humanism is you know prominent, you know, becomes very prominent. I believe it started during that time, um, um, and uh, you know they reformed, and he says their mistake was that they thought that was the end, and that to can that there was no more reformation needed, and he says that. Uh, that's not true. So that's kind of his argument in a nutshell, that you know natural scientists are here and they need to be given more prominence. Um, in fact, there's an interesting thing that he actually cites Arnold as a way to argue against uh, the humanities on, he starts on 1553 and interprets something from the function of criticism by Arnold about uh, the all, you know, the best that has been said and thought in culture. And he takes that for Arnold to mean literature, which is, and Arnold will actually address this in his response. Um, literature and science is a response to science and culture. And so, and Arnold addresses this as the fact that um, he didn't just mean literature. In fact, he makes references to Euclid and Newton as being, you know, text as well that are not necessarily creative texts or literature as a, um, as a Huxley implies it. So. It, it, it's kind of a it, it's a fallacy to kind of attribute that to Arnold because it's a kind of a misreading. But for rhetorical purposes, it probably served as a great you know platform for him to start you know kind of trying to tear into the humanities a bit. In fact, in literature and science, which is actually a lecture in um, the United States um, that respond, and this is the first. And the interesting thing is that this, you know, Arnold initially said he would not enter the debate with Huxley, but of course he makes direct reference to Huxley here. Um, and Huxley never responded to this. Um, in fact, there are other uh, letters and um, speeches that are given that kind of, that show Arnold still addressing the matter. And it kind of shows kind of a self-consciousness that, you know, the humanities are starting to feel a little bit threatened. Um, by by the uh, by the rise of the sciences and what you know, and what and more the more promise they were getting. In fact, he starts out talking about Plato, and when he's talking about Plato, he's more kind of retorting against Plato. He's not actually using Plato for support because Plato he mentions the Republic, and in the Republic, Plato actually uh, would in the Republic, Plato's imagining a uh, society that works much better than um, the current one. Um, and part of his society is the, ex the exclusion of things like poets, unless they're, you know, uh, 
poets and people who talk in fictions because he sees that as a distraction from the you know from the ideal truth that everyone you know that ever that a philosopher king would encourage people to seek even though that truth hasn't been discovered yet you know it's funny that he outs fic there's it, there's a little bit of humor in the fact that he outs fiction as being lies but you know he's pursuing some kind of abstract truth that you know exists somewhere far off somewhere yeah there's a kind of a contradiction there anyways but and you know and uh arnold basically says that some of the ideas of uh plato are not tenable in fact he uses the united states as an example of a place where arts and things can thrive um and he does he does concede that you know plato gets one thing right he kind of takes uh something that plato says about uh um, an intelligent man will prize those studies which result in his soul gaining soberness, righteousness, and wisdom, and will less value the others. And he uses that to apply it to his argument about the humanities, that uh, that it does encourage uh, soberness and things like that. In fact, he constantly relates it back to a sense of conduct and beauty. You know, he kind of has kind of very subjective uh, criteria as to why we should keep the humanities. Um, but uh, on 1439, for instance... He does well. 1438, 1439. He addresses the threat, like you know. He even asks the question if the you know torch will pass from letters to science. By the end, he'll say no. Um, that it, you know the humanities will still you know maintain their prominence. Um, but he does kind of address in 1439 that what uh, Huxley is actually attacking is not what he was talking about um, with you know the best that is said and thought. Um, you know the best that has been said and thought. But he's actually when he says literature he's actually he says that he's actually attacking bell's letters which is you know flowery you know flowery type of uh or beautiful letters like art like uh, poetry or fiction and things like that um and he even takes in consideration that a lot of people will see that as you know elegant but not very useful and which is something that I can't comes up again and again in humanities like what use is a poem uh, what use is a short story it's something that you know a lot of people feel like they have to you know have to defend since it doesn't have you know the same effects as say uh, a vaccine does for instance you know there is a distinct difference between what kind of psycholo you know there's certainly a psychological effect versus a you know physical effect um versus biological one um let's see um in fact, uh, but he does make he does make instances. In fact, there's a nice illustration later on in his essay, in his lecture about uh, you know the diplomat from Brit from British Parliament who comes to the Americas and returns and then says you know America would be great. Uh, who knows something in this member of Parliament knows something about geology and things like that. And he says America would be great um, if only they would take one of our princes to be king of it. And so. That th that kind of you know knowledge and that kind of exchange is where the humanities can be useful as far as you know being more sensitive to other cultures, for instance. Um, and you know, in particular, Arnold is still very defensive with the classics as far as you know giving a sense of you know uh, giving nod to the tradition, but also being informed by the tradition and how th those concepts still work into the present day. In fact, one thing that they had in common. I believe is how they both uh, how both Huxley and Arnold did praise you know Greece for its type of civilization. Um, in fact, there were some points where Arnold even identified common ground with uh, common ground with Huxley. Like he even said, "It's great to know about the natural sciences and what they're discovering, such as uh, you know the candle wax um, uh, um, and turning to ascorbic acid, uh, and, you know, and other." Um, things like that, but he does say on pages like 1442 that science leaves out, you know, science leaves out human nature, um, um, and says, and he actually even says that they can relate to another through a sense of sense of conduct. Um, in fact, it's on page 1444 where he talks about. Um, let's see. In, 
interesting indeed. These results of science are important they are, and we should all of us be acquainted with them. But what I now wish you to mark is that we are still, when we, they are propounded to us, we receive them, we are still in the sphere of intellect and knowledge. And for generality of men there will be found, I say, to arise, when they have duly taken in the proposition that their ancestor was a hairy quadruped furnished with a tail and pointed ears, probably arboreal in habits, there will be found in, to arise an invincible desire to relate this proposition to the sense in us for conduct and to the sense in us for beauty. In fact, he relates that later to emotion, that, you know, you know, science might take care of the rational, you know, cool thought, but it'll never take care of the emotional needs of humans that is part of human nature, which he argues makes things like the classics important as far as relating, you know, those things to the state of a man. Um, whereas, uh, uh, in fact, in science fiction, you see kind of uh, debates like that all the time as far as, you know, if you're too scientific um, and purely rational, then you've lost part of your humanity. <laughs> um, it's also kind of the subject of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, in a sense. In fact, he, he talks about, on 1444, he even talks about Darwin, who says who could, he could do without two things, religion and poetry, and, be, and science and domestic affections are what satisfy him. And part of Arnold's argument is that uh, not everyone, Darwin's are extremely rare, and the great majority of mankind will need things like the humanities, you know, to minister to their emotion and their sense of beauty and conduct. Um, and that's generally, um, on the whole, his, most of his argument. In fact, at the end, in 1449, he says that he claims that the humanities will not lose their place, and if they do, they will regain it back. He's still optimistic but he does you know by admitting that he is recognizing the sciences as being kind of a threat to the status of humanities the privileged status that's held for you know centuries as you know as the source for uh knowledge and that and nevertheless he one of the things that arnold does very well i think is that he does acknowledge the importance of the sciences at the same time that he says you know that they don't necessarily espouse a comparison such as in 1446 he says that you know that it should you know invidious um, comparisons of the merits of letters and sciences should be avoided. Um, but that is basically the debate in a nutshell. And it's still, it, it's still something that continues to this day. And there's actually been things, if you ever look up the Alan Sokol affair, which I can't all have time to go into, um, there are scientists who try to show that the humanities is useless, while there are others who think both on sciences and humanities who think we can you know there are some relationships that we can have that can be you know interdisciplinary work together so it's it, it's tough because things like these debates have caused a splintering between the humanities and sciences that have almost put them at odds um and encouraged some prejudicial attitudes and of course you know they're you know and arnold for his credit does try to reconcile that a little bit as far as that they both have their place um, at the same time, he's still very a very staunch defender of the classics. All right, if you have any questions about this lecture, feel free to uh, contact me.